by next week. Okay. I think it sounds like a great idea. Since, since you're not going to be missing any class, and I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm lost today. I had a I'm lost too. Really stressful week. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. I had a lot to do too. Well, mine was mostly great. Oh. <laughs> Can't get distracted by Jeremiah. That's all. Jeremiah, there's something wrong with that kid. Okay. Uh, so what we determined last time was that, um, according to the National Geographic magazine, they, they had they had tens of thousands of people that, that did this, the scratch test. A third of the population can't smell sweat. We already talked about that before. 29% can't detect uh, musky smells, which are sexual odors. So we've got sexual odors and we've got, uh, we've got sweat that people can't smell. She kind of looks like an anime character, doesn't she? Oh, I didn't see her. No, that's all right. It's not important. <laughs> Women are slightly better than men at detecting odors, especially when they're ovulating. Uh, the ability to detect, to detect odors declines with age. As you get older, you get what they call a nosemia. You lose the ability to smell things which is sometimes not a bad thing, because old people smell bad. Smokers <laughs> tend to have dull senses, of course, because they have all that tobacco running into their, into their noses all the time. I was uh, walking across campus uh, to class, and uh, there was an individual that was smoking a cigarette. And hardly anybody smokes on campus. Mm -hmm. It's probably against the rules or something. No, they've got smoking stations from place to place. Yeah, this was right in front of, well, I don't know where it was. Anyway, as I was going, I could smell him from the fob all the way to this, the, the science building entrance, entrance mm. which is, that's a long way. And he was standing there with two other guys, and he was the only one smoking, and afterwards he field stripped his, his cigarette, which means he put it out and he, and he busted it up and the tobacco went all over yeah. the place. But you could still smell the smoke. You could smell the tobacco out of his cigarette. And I was thinking, you know, when I was in the military, uh, <laughs> you could, some people could detect the enemy even if they couldn't see him. They could smell him, uh, wow. which is kind of interesting. Um, but the thing about Vietnam was that Vietnam is a, um, it's kind of like a sewer. The whole place smells like human feces because they, I know that sounds horrible, uh, well, they fertilize their fields, their, their rice paddies, with uh, human waste. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's kind of nasty. But the whole country smells like rotten, something rot, rotting. Yeah. And human feces has odor, as strange as it may seem. But we could certainly detect tobacco. Uh, and it lingered. Tobacco lingers. Uh, if somebody's a smoker and they smoke in a house, it, it, it'll stink for days. It, the, the odor gets into the, anything soft, as weird as that is. Anyway, the, the odors don't go away. I was just thinking, geez, you know, with all the guys smoking in my unit, and here we are, we're out on patrol, uh, anybody could follow us and smell us. Not only that, but... Uh, uh, but in the United States military, we used to soak everything in creosote so mm -hmm. that it would last longer. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I know we had an odor about us. Um, uh, Gunpowder has a smell to it. Um, yeah. Our weapons smell different than their weapons. Yes. So here we are, we're wandering through the jungle and uh, we're putting off all these odors and anybody and their cousin could smell us. <laughs> if they knew what to, what they were smelling. Can you like sense that too? Like like when you do smell something out of the ordinary, is is that what they tend to follow? Like because they're probably not used, you know, like how yeah, because uh, our food was mostly uh, beef and pork and chicken, and they 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 ate uh, seafood. They ate a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, 
you can smell that. I mean, it, the mutton, the mutton, since I've come here, and it's not nearly as bad now as it was when I first got here, when they, when they used to have mutton every day at, uh, at the cafeteria. But uh, yeah, it gets pretty bad. It gets pretty nasty. <clears throat> sure. <laughs> so if you go to India, if you go to India yeah. where everybody's a vegetarian, almost everybody's a vegetarian, almost nobody eats meat. Mm -hmm. uh, lots, of, lots of different odors because they eat so much of it. And they eat a lot of curry. Yeah, okay. I like curry. You, you like, like curry? You like, you <laughs> like curry. Okay. Well, because like, when I start, first started working at the pharmacy, um, they always had like um, student pharmacists come in and they do the rotation. Sure. And um, one of the girls, she was Indian. And so she would always invite all of us over for dinner and she would cook for us. And a lot of people like spicy food and she used a lot of spices. Right. And it was really, really good. Okay, okay. And she I, always smelled like it was good. I liked it. <laughs> all the spices. She always smelled like the spices she she ate. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Because now, whenever I go somewhere and I see Indian food, I'll eat it. You, you eat the curry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't as strong as the, the curry that your that your friend uh, mm -hmm. made. Yeah, it was. So, yeah, it was. It, they were kind of the same, but she had like a whole bag dedicated just to spices. <laughs> sure. Of course. Uh, back in the day, uh, this is in the 50s and 60s, a lot of people s cooked with lard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they, yeah. I, where was I yesterday? Oh, I went to the, the gas station. And I was thinking, geez. Of course, they deep fat fry something. I don't know what it is back there that they're deep fat frying, but the whole place smells like grease, hot grease. Yeah. We, the one, uh, my grandparents still use the grease for fry bread. Sure, of yeah. course, of course. And when they when they cook the fry bread, there's a really strong odor yeah, in the right. house that, that lingers for it days. Yeah, uh, yeah, the fry bread's great, but the the stinking or the uh, the greasy smell in the house is perpetual, almost perpetual, not quite. Yeah. Uh, but when they used to to cook with lard, of course, they, they had that lardy smell, and everybody, and it would be on their clothes. Or if you had bacon for breakfast, you could tell because especially yeah. if they were the ones that cooked it, it would stay with their clothes. <laughs> and of course, uh, because we're uh, we live in a society, in the society, that's not a proper thing to talk about what people ate, ate for lunch. Uh, you, even if you could smell it on their clothes, we don't try to to notice smells. Yeah, yeah, that's our way of being polite, I guess. <laughs> uh, but we can. I mean, we could potentially. Odors are detected by a sheet of, sh of cells along the top of the nasal cavity called the olfactory epithelium. Um, and you can see it's way up here, or way up at the top of your, it's below one of your sinuses. So if this, this sinus blocks, which is usually the one that blocks if you've got a cold, mm -hmm. then you can't smell anything. Uh, okay. Each receptor cell has a long, slender, apical dendrite that extends to the outermost layer of the epithelium, uh, the mucosal surface, and of course that is what is doing the detecting, this, the odor detecting. There's lots of these guys in there. Uh, and they're replaced constantly. <laughs> At the mucosal surface, numerous cilia uh, emerge from the dendritic knob and extend along the mucosal surface. At the opposite end of each olfactory receptor cell, a tiny unmyelinated axon runs to the olfactory bulb. Uh, if you burn your tongue, um, you, you eat food that's too hot, then you'll lose your sense of taste for, for well, probably 24, 36 hours. Uh, but it doesn't happen with, with the olfactory system. The olfactory system is constantly being replaced. All these, all these cells are constantly, constantly uh, uh, replacing themselves. <clears throat> At the opposite end of the olfactory receptor cell, a ton, tiny unmyelinated uh, axon runs to the olfactory bulb. <clears throat> now the amazing thing is that, uh, that we, can, we can detect so many different odors. We yeah. can tell the difference between this, that, and the other. We know uh, if uh, somebody that uh, we're close to uh, changed their perfume, or they're wearing perfume today. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't... Uh, it's not common here for people to wear uh, 
aftershave or whatever or cologne or anything out there, which is a good thing because I've been I've been in some classrooms where you can tell when you know George walked in or you could tell yeah. when when it's Sally came in because she's got a stink about her. Well, she's got an odor about her because of, of what she wears. Sometimes it's overdone. Too much. Teenagers do this a lot, yeah. They don't wear deodorant as much as they wear cologne and what and stuff. And they <laughs> and they overdo it. Uh, people tell them, oh, you know, you need to wear, I don't even know what's the, uh, karate, high karate. I remember high karate? Uh, maybe, good, that's good. Because it was a really strong <laughs> aftershave. <laughs> and we don't do that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, odorants uh, enter the nasal cavity in the form of free-floating chemical molecules in the air during inhalation. So if you, if you're walking in the, in the hallway and you can, you smell somebody that smell somebody pass gas, mm -hmm. eh, what you're actually smelling is free-floating floating molecules of uh, methane. It's the methane gas. Methane gas mixed with whatever, whatever bacterial uh, functioning has been going on in the guy's bowels. As mm. god awful as that sounds, it's as god awful as you think it is. Sometimes you can. Well, we won't even go into that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the odorants first encounter the mucosal layer, which binds the chemical to the protein for transport to the olfactory uh, epithelium. Uh, so if you don't have a wet, if your nose is too dry, then you can't smell anything. Uh, as long as the, you have a mucosal layer that has some degree of moisture, uh, then you can smell whatever there is around. The viscosity of the mucus layer determines how rapidly an odorant reaches the cilia of the olfactory receptor. If there's too much fluid in your nose, you're not going to smell anything. If there's not enough fluid in your, in your nose, or if it's not moist, uh, then you're not going to smell anything. You have to be able to break it down just like taste. If you can't, if uh, a chemical that you put in your mouth uh, doesn't break down in water, then you can't taste it. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with odors. The, okay, and this gets a little complicated, but it's not really... This is a relatively rapid process. That uh, Odor is one of the first things that we detect. Uh, what did I have over the weekend? Oh, somebody came, sold me a, a package of yeast rolls, and they were still warm. Uh, and because they were still warm, they were putting off moisture, and the moisture, of course, had, had that yeasty smell to yeah. it. So my, my house smelled pretty good for about 15 minutes <laughs> <laughs> until it cooled off. And then I ate them, and did, they didn't have nearly enough yeast and not enough sugar in them. So oh. I know, it was kind of sad. And then I was talking to a lady about fry bread, and uh, she said, uh, and she asked me, she asked me if the uh, fry bread here was as good as the fry bread up north. And I told her, no, they put more yeast in, in their fry bread up north. And so they expand more. It's more like a donut. You know, it doesn't sound good to you. Okay. Uh -huh. You like that? Like doughy? You like it? Oh, yeah. Really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, oh, geez. They're, their fry bread eats like candy. Fry bread is supposed to be crispy. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> uh, Navajo tacos. See, Navajo, ta Navajo tacos don't have, you guess don't use yeast in your, in your fry bread, so I know it doesn't have the same flavor. Now it doesn't have a strong flavor. Yeah. It doesn't have the yeasty flavor. Maybe that's why they are, there's more alcoholics up north. Because beer and yeast, you have to use yeast to make beer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, well, maybe, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, so this is a really complicated process, but it's, it's fairly rapid, and that's the thing that, I, that, you, that you need to remember. The odor it, uh, then reacts with the receptor protein located on the surface of the olfactory cilia and the dendritic knob of the receptor cells. These proteins are members of the complex family of proteins referred to as G-protein-linked receptors. <clears throat> How many, how many odors can we as humans detect? And the answer is trillions of different odors. Yeah. We know when we're in, you know when you're in Albuquerque, you know when you're in Gallup, you know when you're in Phoenix, you know when you're in, in the airport, you know when you're 
when a bus just drove by. I mean, we know all of these different odors. Yeah. We can detect them all, we can identify them all if we pay attention to all, the way things smell. Mm -hmm. We can smell it, uh, millions of different odors. Uh, we can tell the difference between too much yeast and not enough yeast. I can tell when something is cooked. When my wife's cooking something, I can tell her when they're finished. She can't. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I don't know. <laughs> you were saying that. <laughs> I, I don't have any idea why she can't. <laughs> it's so obvious to me. Um, uh, you know when you're, if the uh, cat has a bowel movement, you know the difference between the cat's bowel movement and the dog's fart because they eat different foods. You know when the cat took a whiz in the, in the, in the box because cat urine has a dis distinct smell, especially if it's a tomcat because they have a really distinct smell. Uh, the G protein linked receptor combines with a molecule of GTP which displaces GDP. The G protein alpha subunit uh, dissociates with that and activates adenyl cyclase which produces cyclic uh, A and P. I know this sounds like a really uh, uh, intricate process, but it happens almost instantaneously. Even though this whole process has to take place in order for you to, de to detect an odor. And most of the odors that you smell, you don't detect. You don't need to. Your, your book smells like something. Your, pen, your ink from your pen smells like something. But you're not noticing it. Cyclic A and P binds the sodium channel and opens it. The sodium uh, enters the cell. Uh, this generates a generator uh, potential, which creates a generator potential, which is uh, uh, interpreted in the brain as a specific odor. Okay. Yeah. So we, we can tell the difference between all these different, all these different odors. Mm -hmm. The receptor protein returns uh, to an unbound state, of course, and then the whole process starts again. Uh, it, it all uh, depends on how much, uh, how strong the odor is, uh, as to how many epithelial cells are, uh, epithelial receptor cells are being uh, stimulated. <clears throat> and then, of course, now, now we understand what, what the odor is. Now, how important are odors? Well, not very high. Who knows? If it's a poison, if it's gas. Uh, I turned on the oven. I was going to heat up my yeast rolls uh, on Saturday, and uh, it smelled like uh, I was cooking uh, dead mice. I know. So I turned off my oven. <laughs> I turned on my broiler, which I probably shouldn't have done. But uh, it smelled like there was a dead mouse in there, so I turned it off. There was it was putting off a really strange uh, odor. Um, if you're around natural gas and you smell it, uh, what does it smell like? Well, it doesn't smell like anything, actually. The methane doesn't smell like anything unless you mix it with something. Well, so what they smell, they mix it with, so that you know that you're being killed, it being asphyxiated, they put sulfur in it, and that's why it smells like rotten eggs. So that's why, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, that's why uh, natural gas stinks so bad, because they put sulfur in it. Hmm. What, uh, what else today? Oh, I was reading about uh, a mammoth, a woolly mammoth. Um, they found a woolly mammoth uh, carcass up in uh, up on one of the islands in the Arctic, mm -hmm. um, and they determined it was only four thousand years old. I know we haven't found anything any woolly mammoth that is this young <coughs> before. <coughs> um, they were trying to figure out why it died, and what they determined was that the water source uh, somehow it had accumulated a lot of sulfur and the sulfur poisoned the mammoth, and that's why it died. Um, if you... <laughs> My sister used to live in Carmel, Indiana. If you, if you know anything about Indianapolis, it's not really important. Carmel, is, Carmel and Fishers are where all the rich people live. It's, it wasn't that my sister was rich. She found a bungalow over by the river which is not the nicest place to be because it floods from time to time. So it's, it was on the floodplain. Mm -hmm. uh, big mistake. But uh, the, the, her water smelled like sulfur. I mean, when you took a shower, if you went to my sister's house and took a shower, 
Uh, you, it smelled like you were bathing in rotten eggs. It was that bad. Wow. Yeah, so that you had this sulfury odor about you, you know, because it's water and it's, it's splashing over you and you're getting all this sulfur on you, despite the fact you're, and her soap wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't foam. Couldn't get her, her soap to foam. So if you're, wow. you know, washing yourself, you're scraping this, the, the soap all over your body, but it's not making any foam or anything. Wow. So you can only assume that you're cleaning yourself. Her water was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what she needed was a, a water softener. But my sister didn't smell things very well. She, she didn't have a very good sense of smell, so she didn't find her water odiferous. She didn't find it stinky. Mm -hmm. I did, of course. I could tell when they turned on the tap of water, when they were, you know, cleaning, when they were washing the dishes. Her, her dish soap would, would foam. I know it was, it was really <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> I know, but everything in her house smelled like sulfur. But it was okay as long as she didn't. She wasn't running a, a load of clothes or something. Her clothes smelled. I thought they did. They smelled like sulfur. Well, that's rotten eggs. Nobody wants to. They mean to smell like rotten yeah. eggs. Anyway, not important. <laughs> <laughs> pheromones. Okay, so now we're going to talk about pheromones, and this is something that may not make any sense to you because potentially you guys don't have pheromones. Mm -hmm. uh, since, well, we have already discussed that uh, ad nauseum. Pheromones are detected through the vomeronasal organ, which is right here. Here's your, here's your olfactory bulb up here. Okay. So your vomeronasal organ is way, way down low. Uh, most researchers think it's vestigial. In other words, it's something that we don't use anymore. But there are people that respond to it, including me. So I think it really exists. I don't know how important it is. Uh, I've talked to my wife about, uh, about pheromones, and she doesn't think that she uh, utilizes pheromones either. But I know I have in my past, and it is my wife's pheromones that attracted me to her. One of the things that attracted me to my wife is the fact that she puts off uh, Pheromones that, that I find agreeable. <clears throat> I've had uh, girlfriends, uh, my second wife, uh, reacted to pheromones, unless she was drinking. Okay. <laughs> can that happen though? Like, as any type of substance can derail like, your pheromones? Well, I, if you're uh, sure, yeah, she, because she wasn't. She wasn't thinking along with her when she when she drank. She just kind of went stupid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she wasn't thinking when she was drinking. Yeah. When I met her, she wasn't drinking, and one of the reasons she liked me was because she didn't drink around me. And then something happened uh, about our fifth month into into our marriage, and she started drinking, and mm -hmm. she, she was a completely different person. When she drank. Wow. Yeah, I mean, her personality changed changed completely. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, she couldn't imagine uh, what people tell you and what people are thinking may be two different things. But what she was saying before was she did she wasn't really attracted to anybody but me because she liked my odor mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, that was part of it anyway. But when she uh, when she started drinking, you know, she was attracted to like anybody in pants, <clears throat> which was kind of interesting. So she turned off that part of her brain or it wasn't important to her at that point. Mm -hmm. As stupid as that sounds. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah. She started like dating the whole base. <laughs> Let me see if no, I can get this thing to work. <laughs> These are really kind of interesting. You can believe it or not believe it, it's not really important. Yeah. Uh, let's just do one of them. Let's do the one I was thinking of. Come on. Mm. Oh, wait, wait, before you show that, can you go back to the other slide? Sure. Or not. Wait a second. Something's going on. There we go. Come on. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, because you didn't read the second. Well, yeah, here's a, your vulnerable nasal organ. It's right, right on the inside of your nose. Yeah. And here's your up. Your, all, your olfactory all this is way, way up above your sinuses. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> we need to be able to detect odors fairly rapidly, uh, mainly because of poisons, because of methane, because of all of these things that can kill us. Mm -hmm. So we need to know that they exist. Um, let me try to turn this thing on one more time. Okay. Uh, you know, this isn't that important. Why don't we just skip it? <laughs> Let's not worry about it. <laughs> I'm the only one. I, I'm really fascinated by pheromones. Because, I, I, because they really exist for me. And, it, it, it's something they, for me to learn, too. Yeah, but I mean, you're never going to even deal with this. Pro well, potentially you are. If you, have, if you are around uh, a significant other that is, uh, that actually can detect pheromones. I don't know that I can get this thing to work, but uh, that's okay. I'll let you watch it on your own. They're kind of interesting. And there's three of them, right? There's three, yeah, there's okay. three of them. Uh, the second one is a PowerPoint that, that somebody threw together in medical, school, in medical school. This one's kind of interesting because uh, it's uh, it's a uh, television program from uh, England, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody is so English in this. In this thing. <laughs> uh, especially the woman, <laughs> she's, she's got this really strange overbite, but she is so English. And the the uh, they have one guy that's that's exercising. Uh, they have three guys that are they're trying to prove that women are attracted to one thing or another. So they have one guy that puts on the pheromone spray, a really ugly guy that puts on the pheromone spray. They put a, they have a dwarf that puts on uh, aftershave. Then they have this really, really attractive guy that uh, uh, exercises and sweats. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she can't see him. All she can do is smell them. So she smells the guy that puts on the pheromone spray and she thinks that he smells bad. Uh, the guy with an app with aftershave, he smells good, even though he's only two feet tall or f three feet tall. Uh, and the uh, the guy that does the exercising and, and has the natural sweat, uh, she finds him you know, somewhere in between the aftershave and the stinky pheromone smell. But uh, then she has to pick which one she wants to date for that night. She picks the guy with the aftershave because she can't see him. She has no idea what him look like. It's just her, her just her sense of smell. She's sense. reacting uh, by her sense of smell. As much fun as that is. Anyway, <laughs> that's the way it works. <laughs> uh, but they're also English, uh, except for the the guy with muscles. He, I think he's an American. The birds don't really do that kind the of stuff. The one with the the sweat. Yeah, the one with oh. sweat. Yeah, he's very muscular. I uh, he he jogs in place and does push-ups. I don't know if that's going to work up enough sweat for them. But she didn't react to him, <clears throat> except when she saw him. She was quite, quite taken with his, with his attractiveness. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, vision, chapter 10, if I can make this thing work. All right. I'm having all kinds of interesting problems today. Oh, there it works. Okay. <laughs> Why are you doing that? So good. <laughs> Why is everything working so slow? Oh, maybe my battery's dying. The whole whole area that you can see without moving your head or eyes is known as your visual field. We all have different visual fields. Mine's pretty good. <clears throat> I can see, I can see, uh, I can't even move my arms back far enough. I can still see this. So my vi visual field is, is pretty big. I have a brother with tunnel vision. So his visual field is small, is relatively small, but he sees really well in the dark. 
which was a good thing, is a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is he survived Vietnam. The bad thing was that they'd send him out at night uh, to ambush uh, the enemy. <clears throat> they'd send him into uh, tunnels. He's a tunnel rat. He's a little bit, he's, he's about my size. We're not very big people. We were about the same size as the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese, if they weigh over 100 pounds, that's a, that's a pretty big Vietnamese person. This is the males, not the females. The females are, tiny, are fairly small. Uh, but the, so the spider holes, is what, that's what we called them. The spider holes were holes that they dug so that they could uh, move around inside the ground. And uh, they, we were, they were undetectable by us unless we found their, the opening. But the holes, the opening was not very big, and you'd have to, I would, I couldn't crawl into one, but my brother could. He had smaller shoulders than I had. So he was able to crawl into them. The, Chi the Chinese, the, the Vietnamese have really narrow shoulders, relatively narrow shoulders, for it, so it wasn't a problem for them, but, you know, a, a normal-sized American person is a lot bigger than the Viet Vietnamese guy. Yeah. Anyway, so my brother had tunnel vision. He still has tunnel vision. He can see really, really well at night. Uh, this guy, as far as he's concerned, uh, daylight is a little bit blinding, and at night he can see really, really well. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. While the visual field may be wide, an individual's visual acuity tends to be only in the middle of the field of vision. So mine, my field of vision is, is really, really wide, uh, but I can I can focus on, on this portion of, of my eyesight. So when I read, of course, I'm, I'm looking with the middle of my vision uh, to, uh, to read. This is because there's a concentration of cones in the middle of your visual field, an area known as your fovea. So your fovea is, is where you detect color. It's right in the middle of your, of your visual field. Well, one of the things we're going to, to find out is that uh, the uh, your ability to see light uh, comes from the rods. Uh, your ability to detect color comes from your from your fovea or your your cones. Uh, there's only eight million cones in both your uh, four million in each eye. And they're all right concentrated right in the middle of the visual field. You have a hundred million rods you know, throughout your 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 ability to see, I mean your visual field. So a lot of times you can see light, but you can't, you don't know what color it is. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I was, uh, I, I ran down in my, I have a uh, treadmill down in my basement in Iowa. <clears throat> and I was, uh, I turn off all the lights and then I go upstairs after I'm finished running. And I kept seeing this yellow light. I kept seeing this yellow light and I couldn't find it. Why is there a yellow light? And then what happened? What, what was going on? I was seeing it through my, the corner of my visual field. And since the corner of my visual field doesn't detect color, I was seeing it as yellow, as a yellow light. Well, it turned out to be a red light. Mm -hmm. It was a red light that I was seeing as yellow because I was seeing it out of the corner. And then when I looked directly at it, I, couldn't, I didn't think that was, the, that was the right light because I saw it as yellow. Yeah. As stupid as that sounds, it took me like days to figure out that I was looking at the same <laughs> light. I'm not real bright sometimes. Uh, this is because there's a concentration of cones. Okay, we already talked about the concentration of cones. Uh, this is the center of your of your visual field. If we saw it out of the corner of our eyes, our eyes at the corner of our visual field, we really wouldn't be able to detect as much. It would be uh, a, uh, a different. Uh, we would have a different picture of it, maybe. <laughs> okay, that thing's going to change in a minute. However, even with the concentration of visual receptors in the center of the visual field, there is a spot where the optic nerve feeds out. Go back, go back. And this is known as the blind spot. Um, so there's a blind spot in the middle of our visual field. Oh, I went forward. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to move it back right yeah. Ah, yeah, you can see it's being stupid here. Oh, it was, anyway. All right. It's still going forward. Well, shoot. <laughs> Something's going on. Come on. I, 
I'm too impatient. I, I hit my the button too many times. That's my problem. Come on, one more. Thing. Yes, one more. Yeah. The loading. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So this is our blind spot. And our blind spot is filled in. Uh, we fill, our brains fill in the blind spot because everything needs to make sense to us. So rather than having a blind spot, that, this constant blind spot, this constant black spot in the middle of our visual field, our brains just fill in the picture. Hopefully it fills in correctly. <clears throat> I want to be here. Come on, one more. Our, our brains fill it in. Uh, I don't know if it's correct or not. It's spinning. I have no idea why it's doing that. Yeah, so on, normally it just fills in the blind spot. One time. Okay. It'll change in a minute. Maybe. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, vision comes to humans in the form of wavelengths of light or photons. Uh, the human visual ability lies between 400 and 700 nanometers. Uh, that's from ultraviolet to infrared. So we can see that that's how broad our, the spectrum is. Now, not everybody sees between 400 and 700, depending on your eye color, the color of your iris. Uh, you, uh, if you have blue eyes or green eyes or gray eyes, it lets in more light. If you've got brown eyes like you do, you're lucky uh, because the brown, the brown filters out more of the sunlight. So you see better in the, in the daylight than I do. But potentially I see better at night than you do. Which is kind of interesting because you guys have taboos about doing anything at night. You can't whistle at night, you can't, I don't know, I don't know if you're even supposed to go outside at night. That's a question. <clears throat> That's when skinwalkers are out there. I know. Okay. So, um, uh, but of course, my culture doesn't have anything, any taboos about about night, except uh, when the Europeans first came over here, they were, sc they were scared of the forest. The forest. The forest. Well, yeah, all the forests had been cut down in Europe, you know, two or three hundred years before. So. They were, they were used to being around, uh, not being around trees, not being around places where it was dark at night. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <clears throat> very different. And not only that, but if even in Europe in the, in the 16th and 17th century, uh, they had streetlights. Mm -hmm. uh, they had streetlights in, in ancient Greece, or at least they had lights on every corner in ancient Greece. So they were rarely in the dark. Uh, a lot of people never spend their whole lives in, in, in daylight, in light. Uh, there's always, there has to be lights on every place. They never walk, they never walk around in the dark. Uh, we, we're doing that with our military now. Um, in the old days, like what happened with my brother, since my brother had the ability to see in, at, at night in the dark, um, he was highly sought after. Um, but now we have we have those, I, I, I can't remember what, what uh, Scott was calling them, but they have the infrared stuff that mm. you can see in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it shows every, every, all light comes off as green. Mm -hmm. um, but of course my brother sees that well without, without those, those that things, well, not them. quite as well, that, that good. But so, you know, we have this broad spectrum, it's a, a broad spectrum of uh, our ability to see uh, in the light and the dark. Um, other animals have different ranges of vision that, that encompasses a wider spectrum of light. Dogs see very fairly well at night. Cats see very well. They hunt at night. Cats have hunt at night. So their, their night vision is very, very good. Humans, not so good. <clears throat> but uh, last night it was about 1130 and I ran out of wood. So I just walked out to my wood pile and, and picked up some wood. Well, my street light's out. I don't Thank God it burned out about a year and a half ago. Uh, so it's really dark at my house, uh, but I had no problem walking out to my wood pile, picking up some wood, and carrying it back in. The problem isn't the dark, the problem is light creates shadow. 
in the uh, I'm I'm on the back fence, so the uh, elementary school is right behind there, and it's oh, okay. all lit up like crazy. Uh, so it creates shadows, and, and you can't see you can't see in the shadows because the light is yeah is uh, interrupting your ability to see. But if you spend five ten minutes outside, uh, pretty soon you can see fairly well. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. You can see fairly well. <laughs> Some people in my neighborhood leave their back lights on all the time. They have lights on all over their houses, which seems like a waste of electricity to me. Yeah. And it's not, I, and they see it as more secure, but I don't see it as more secure. I can see better at night. I can be, see better in the dark. I would imagine that if somebody came to, to do me harm or to steal something from me, uh, I'd be able to see better than they better than they can. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they had those night night vision goggles on. Uh, bees uh, can detect beyond the ultraviolet light. As a matter of fact, they can tell where other bees have flown because they can see their uh, their heat pattern. And this is how they follow they they follow each other to uh, to to a food source mm -hmm. uh, because they can see. Ultraviolet light. Just bees? Are, are there any other animals or insects? Well, it's really hard to ask an animal how well they could see. <laughs> how, how did they like figure out bees could? The, well, that's what they did. Well, what happened was they had a, um, a camera that detected ultraviolet light. And so they started seeing these flight patterns. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bees put off because of their their heat or something it has something to do with it may be, may have to do with the friction of, of their their wings in the in the in the air mm -hmm. uh, but they detected these ultraviolet patterns uh, flight patterns uh, and then of course and they follow them they follow the flight patterns fairly directly so mm -hmm. they they determined that they could see they could see uh, ultraviolet light. A photon of light comes into our eyes uh, with, a select, with select properties that we will perceive as color. The hue is the wavelength of light. The wavelength in the 400 to 500 range are very dark purples to blue. Wavelengths in the 500 to 600 range are greens to orange with yellow in the middle. And wavelengths in the 600 to 700 range are bright reds darkening to black. So we have three different uh, ranges of, of our co color detection. Mm -hmm. uh, women are better at detecting color than men are. Men are more likely to be colorblind than women are. It's very rare to find a, a woman who is colorblind. And it's because it's on the X chromosome. Your sense of, of color, detect, being able to, de to detect color is on the X chromosome. For a woman to be uh, to be colorblind, she would have to have the same flaw on each of her X chromosomes. For a man to be colorblind, he just needs the flaw on the X chromosome because the Y chromosome doesn't cancel it out. And that's one of the reasons why men are so goofy when it comes to colors, why they never match things. Mm -hmm. They have such a poor sense of taste or color detection. Yeah. They think things go together that don't actually match. Because, yeah, they're just throwing greens together, well, which is what I did today. My, my jacket's green and my pants are green. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a uh, fluorescent green uh, shoestrings. <laughs> All greens today. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I have a red shirt on. Okay. I thought the red went with the green better than uh, I've got a blue shirt and a gray shirt. So. <laughs> I guess I could have worn the gray shirt, but I'm just as bad as anybody else. My my Y chromosome didn't cancel out my my mother's inability to uh, to see uh, to see colors. Uh, she was she wasn't very good at uh, putting colors together either. My mother wasn't. Yeah. I don't know that that's important. My sister complains about it all the time. Not my mother, but she complains about the fact that none of her brothers have any color sense. Like we give a shit. <laughs> She's our sister. Why would we care what she says? My other sister wasn't very good at uh, putting colors together either. 
Uh, since most color detected uh, as patterns of light in different wavelengths, so brightness refers to the amount of white light coming off of the object. Uh, so the purer a color, the uh, more uh, the brighter the color is. And this is one of the reasons why there there are three primary colors. I'm trying to think what they are: uh, blue, red, and yellow. Yeah. Yeah, blue, red, and yellow. Uh, green, of course, is a mixture of two colors. It's a color of a mixture of red and red and blue. Is no. that right? No, yellow and yellow blue. And blue. Yeah, yellow and blue. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> the, there's a reason why you can see red lights from from a long, long distance, and red lights usually mean danger or mean stop. Uh, they're trying to get you to uh, to react to uh, to the colors. Mm -hmm. uh, but green means go, and green is, is a much duller color than either yellow or red. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, go and caution, I'm sorry, stop and caution are our primary colors, yellow and red. Mm -hmm. And then the go, the go sign is, is uh, green. Now, interestingly, if you go to a Europe, uh, their police vehicles, uh, instead of having red flashing lights, have blue flashing lights, which is another primary color. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what are we doing? Oh, we're putting off white light. Okay. Saturation has to do with the amount of light of a select wavelength. Of all the photons uh, reflecting from an object, uh, we're at 510 nanometers. The object would be highly saturated as green if it was everything coming off of it was at 510 nanometers. But it's rarely that way. Colors are, are, we very rarely have pure colors. Uh, usually they're a mixture. So you're not going to find, well, black is, is uh, uh, something over 700 nanometers. That's why it looks black. Uh, so the color coming off of it isn't very, uh, isn't extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can saturate all the color, then something will be primarily invisible. This is what happens in a black hole. It, uh, it absorbs all the light. Mm -hmm. And since it absorbs all the light, everything looks black. This is how we made a, uh, created stealth fighters and stealth bombers, is we, that we were able to put a paint uh, on these objects so that they look really dark gray. <clears throat> so they're undetectable. Radar doesn't pick them up, as weird as that is, because there's no, uh, uh, it's detecting photons as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and since there are, are very few photons coming off of this object, it looks like, uh, it looks like a cloud moving across the radar uh -huh. screen. Okay. I know. <clears throat> St stealth. I know, we're trying, we're trying to, to uh, come up with a paint that makes, uh, that reflects other photons, so that or, or it it actually absorbs all, all the photons. So when you look at it at it, uh, all you see is a reflection of what's around it. Mm -hmm. okay. I know this gets really weird. That's interesting, though. Yeah, it's kind of pretty fascinating. Uh, the eye acts like a much like a camera. Of course, we don't. Nobody uses a camera anymore. We all use our telephones. Uh, to take pictures. Yeah. Uh, the eye has a transparent sac called the lens that widens and narrows to focus light on the retina. Uh, it also leads to a proper focusing. Uh, is the cornea uh, or the curved outer cover of the eye that changes the light beam as it enters the eye. And this is the, the, the lens and the cornea is the, the uh, uh, structure uh, of the outside of your eye. Now, you can have a problem with these things. My wife was born with an astigmatism. If I can, there it goes, okay. Uh, the shape of the lens is controlled by a set of muscles around the, the lens called the ciliary muscles. Uh, when the lens is made to widen or shorten to allow for focusing, it is known as accommodation. And of course, that's how we focus on things. If I'm looking at something really close and then I look at something far away, my lens is, is adjusting. Uh, it's not immediate, it's pretty close, but as you get older, of course, your ability to accommodate uh, uh, decreases. As a young pup like you are, you probably have no problems with accommodation. Do you wear uh, 
contact lenses? No. Okay. So you, you probably have 20, 20, maybe 2010 vision. Really good vision. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I congratulate you. A lot of people <laughs> wear glasses, especially uh, natives for mm -hmm. some reason. It's, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that so many Indians would wear glasses. All my, my grandma, my aunts, my sisters, my nieces, they, only the women in my family have glasses. Isn't that weird? How very strange. We were talking about this yesterday when we were watching the football game. Okay. Yeah. All the women had their glasses on and none of the, no, none of the men had My dad doesn't have glasses. Yeah. My grandpa hasn't even begun to, like... He doesn't even have presbyo? No. How he, old is he? He's 79. Oh my goodness, and he doesn't need... He hasn't... Does he read a lot? Yeah. He, my, both my grandparents, they're, they still read and they still do, like... Your grandparents is with the crossword right. puzzles and all that stuff. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That's amazing. Um, well, uh, you know, these guys, are, those guys up north are, are buffalo hunters, and they all wear glasses. And it's so <laughs> weird. Funny. They either wear glasses or contact lenses. And it was just so strange. And not only that, but if I were, I wear glasses, reading glasses, so that I can read. But they had... Uh, so I am uh, farsighted, but they're nearsighted. So if they want to read, they lift their glasses up. It's, it's, it's like opposite of what my problem, what presbyopia is. Okay. As weird as that is. Okay. Anyway. I'm sorry that you wear glasses, but we're going to find out that women have poorer eyesight than men do. As interesting as that is. <laughs> Uh, the shape of the lens is controlled by a set of muscles around the lens called this. Oh, we've already talked yeah. about accommodation. Okay, now we'll try to get this thing to change. At birth, about 15% of males and 18% of females have a severe enough eye problem to require a correction. That's an awful lot of people, but as you can see, more females than males. By age 20, until they go through presbyopia, and presbyopia can start anywhere in the 40s or at, with your grandfather who still doesn't have presbyopia. Uh, he, uh, he doesn't have a problem with accommodation even at, this, uh, even at his advanced age. Uh, I, I developed presbyopia in my 50s. Uh, of course I was working in the laboratory so I was looking through a microscope a lot. So mm -hmm. it, the accommodation was, was fairly extreme since I was using a microscope. Uh, in, about, in my 50s I started needing to wear reading glasses. Uh, it's not very strong. It's only one, uh, one and a half, oh, okay. which isn't very strong. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't need uh, regular glasses. I just need reading glasses to read with. Uh, by age 20, 48% uh, of females and 32% of males require correction. I don't know what that means. Uh, so almost half of women need glasses, and about a third of men do. Nearsightedness or myopia is where the eyeball is too long and the, the nearest, uh, clearest focus occurs before the light hits the, the uh, retina, and that's nearsightedness. And that's usually the accommodation uh, that is needed in presbyopia, nearsightedness. Your, your eyeball just doesn't... Uh, why is this going so slow? Farsightedness or hyperopia is where the eyeball is too short and the best focus point is past the retina. And astigmatism is a misshapen cornea. Uh, the cornea is elongated. That causes the light to pass incorrectly into the eye and cause the individual to be nearsighted. Uh, my wife, when she was in elementary school, her name is Urity started with a Y's, and everybody does everything in alphabetical order. So unfortunately, she was way, way in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. Way, way in the back of the room. And she couldn't see, she couldn't see the board. So they thought she, there was a problem, she had a problem. Well, she did have a problem, she couldn't see, but of course, they didn't understand that until they took her to the optometrist, and the optometrist said she has an astigmatism. Um. And then they corrected her, her eyesight, and she all of a sudden, realized that uh, that trees had leaves. 
she was so nearsighted that she didn't realize they had leaves because they just looked as like a big green blob to her yeah. while she was growing up. Wow. I know. It must have been. And that is, and ex that is, is it genetic? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Her astigmatism. Uh, which is kind of curious because her dad was in the military at the time. Uh, they boarded him out of the service because, uh, uh, because of his uh, severe astigmatism and because of his cataracts. His family has cataracts, but only the males have cataracts. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, my wife has a brother, uh, and he's already had uh, two sets of cataract surgeries. Uh -huh. First, in the old days, cataract surgery was completely different than it is today. Uh -huh. uh, uh, cataract surgery is a clouding of the lens. Uh, so today we can just shave, it, shave off your cornea and get rid of the, the, uh, the cataracts. Uh, but in, the, in those days, of course, you had to take a scalpel and you had to shave off the, uh, the eyeball. Hmm. Uh, and then, then they had to, to, of course, the eye, your eye repairs very rapidly. Uh, this is a very important part of your body. It, it, like I keep saying, the human body wants to be fixed. It wants to be pure. It wants to be balanced all the time. Yeah. So uh, your mucous membranes heal very rapidly, and there's a mucous membrane you know, covering your eyeball. And uh, so if you injure your eye today, it may be healed tomorrow. All you need to do is, is take a nap, and it'll, it heals itself. I know, but what they had to do in the old days, since they were using a scalpel to shave this thing off, a lot of times they were making these, these micro cuts in the, in the eyeball. Uh, and if they, um, if the individual tried to use their eyes within 24 hours, a lot of times if they moved their head, you know, so they needed a lot of accommodation, uh, they would, uh, it would scar. And if it's scarred, of course, that's worse than the, the, the cataracts. Uh, so what they would have them do is they would have to lay completely still for 24 hours. They couldn't move their head. Mm -hmm. And they covered their eyes. And then, then they healed up properly and everything was fine. Cataracts were gone. And they tried that with her dad and it didn't really take very well. It was a military hospital and the guy was kind of new, so he, he didn't do a very good job. So they had to, they boarded him out of the service mm -hmm. as a major. <clears throat> but he had retirement pay, so what the hell? Anyway. <laughs> and her brother has already had uh, two, uh, two sur uh, cataract surgeries. Uh, the iris is a muscular uh, covering under the cornea that gives the eye its color. Uh, the pupil is an opening in the iris that allows light to enter the eye. Uh, the movement of the eyeball itself is controlled by extraocular muscles that uh, just make the thing flip back and forth uh, all the time. Um, your eyesight is not static. Uh, your eyes are moving all the time. Uh, and, and it's to, to get a, a full picture. Um, if you were paralyzed, then uh, what you would see, you, you would see flashes of different pictures. But since we, we're moving all the time, we're changing all those pixels uh, that, that make up a picture, it gives us a, a clearer uh, vision of what's going on. Uh, probably you have better eyesight than I do. I'm 70, you're, you're much, much younger than that. Uh, and because of that, um, what you see and I see are totally different. Probably totally different. You you see things clearer than I do. Uh, so if we were both eyewitnesses to something, uh, potentially you would see it differently than I do. For one thing, you couldn't be in the same position that I'm I'm in because I'm standing here and you're standing there. You know, so you're seeing some, something totally different than I do. Okay, <clears throat> and this is going on in our brains all the time. We're trying to interpret what we're seeing. Maybe. <laughs> there it goes. Why is 
is so slow. The photoreceptor cells of most animals are part of, a, of the retina on the back of the uh, inside of the eyeball. Uh, the retina is very thin, but still contains five distinct layers, as weird as that is. This is an actual picture of these five distinct layers, even though this thing is really, really tiny. And as you can see, they, uh, uh, they are very distinct. Uh, the first layer is the optic nerve fiber uh, layer. This is working from the inside out. Uh, this is the inside, and that is out. Uh, so strangely enough, what we are the uh, the outer layer, the one that is the closest to the outside world, is this is this pigmented epithelial layer, and what every what uh, the uh, the eye detects is what reflects off of the epithelial layer. This is really strange. You would think it would all be reversed that the epithelial layer would be against the back of the eyeball, but it's not. This, this whole layer, the epithelial layer, is on the outside. Okay. Now remember, we've got uh, two, two mil 200 million uh, 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 rods and we have eight, eight, uh, eight million cones. Mm -hmm. Okay. So literally, all of the information from our eyesight is coming in in masses of 208 million pixels. That's what makes up a picture for us. Yeah. Okay. As weird as that seems. That's cool. Not only that, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, and what we're actually seeing is a reflection off the, uh, off the pigmented layer. Yeah. So if a light is too bright, if, we, if you look at that, if these lights, these lights are fairly bright, which is one of the complaints about uh, these, these type, this type of lighting. Uh, if it's too bright, it blinds you. Uh, you get uh, a, a mass reflection off of the epithelial layer, <clears throat> the pigmented epithelial layer. At night, if you shine a light, uh, if you're in the dark and you shine a light uh, toward an animal, you can see its eyeballs. Yeah. You can see the light reflecting off its eyeballs. So when I'm not driving down the road, what I'm looking for are deer eyeballs. That's what I'm looking for. You can't see the mass because it's it's uh, camouflage. Yeah. But you can see the eye. Yes. And luckily, thank <laughs> God, the uh, uh, deers, uh, their eyeballs are, are they can see very well at night because their epithelial layer is so bright. Mm -hmm. Same way with dogs. Same way with cats. You can see a cat. You can see a dog. Uh, but if you ever dry, have you ever, ever seen an armadillo? Not around. Yeah. Not around here. Have you, have you ever driven in Texas or Oklahoma or Mississippi? In Oklahoma, but I don't think You I've don't seen remember seeing any armadillos? Yeah, I don't think Well, if you saw an armadillo at night, you didn't see its eyeballs because they can't see. All they, they can barely see. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a real dull green color. Uh, if you if you if you come across a deer, you can see their, their eyes to shine white. Mm -hmm. That's how bright they are. Yeah. Uh, dogs, if a dog has is blind and it's got cataracts or something covering its eyes, its its eyes are red. Mm -hmm. Humans, if you shine a light on us at night, you can you can't even see our eyeballs because they're they're so dark. Yeah. We don't see very well at light, at night. Yeah. And then it's red. It looks it looks red. You can see it every once in a while. If you take a picture, your the oh, eyes yeah, yeah. look red. <laughs> It'll red out your eyes. Okay. So th that's the pigmented epithelial layer. The second layer are the ganglion cells. The third layer are the bipolar cells. The fourth layer is the actual photoreceptor cells themselves, the rods and cones. And the fifth layer is made up of the pig pigmented epithelial, epithelial layer. These are the rods and cones. So as we saw this before, yeah, there we go. We can see how, you can, you can see all the different cells, mm -hmm. okay. as exciting as that is. And come on. <laughs> oh, this is too much fun. There it goes. All right. The rods and the cones detect light uh, that reflects off the pigmented epithelium. Uh, the rods and cones release neurotransmitters that synapse with the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells synapse with the ganglion cells that form the optic nerve. 
Now we have all of these cells that um, uh, will intercede to what we see. Uh, and the reason it does that is because if the light is too bright, uh, then we don't want to destroy any of this, this structure. Uh, so it will, um, it will dampen, it will buffer uh, the, uh, what we see. Uh, you can lose uh, various uh, uh, of these cells, these rods and cones, you can lose them if you're not careful. Uh, if you look into too much bright light, uh, potentially they will, it will destroy these, these cells. It will destroy your optic nerve. So you have to be kind of careful, especially if you look at the sun, which isn't a very good idea at all. Uh, little, little, little rods and cones. Okay, the rods and the cones release neurotransmitters. Bipolar cells synapse with the ganglion cells that form the optic nerve. Okay, so what we're doing is we're trying to keep from going blind. Is what we're doing. Maybe. In a minute. There we go. Uh, while most of the communication in the retina runs from outer layer to the inner layer in a vertical pattern, amacrine. Amacrine and horizontal cells communicate with cells in a horizontal pattern. Horizontal cells connect receptor cells. Amacrine cells connect the bipolar and ganglion cells. And this is to shut down the whole process if you're looking at something that's too bright to keep from going blind. But it gets better. The rods and the cones represent different functional systems. The scotopic system consists of all the rods in each eye, 100 million cells. Uh, the scotopic system is very sensitive to weak light, but cannot detect color. And that's what happened with me when I saw that light. I thought it was yellow, it turned out to be red. It was a red light. Uh, light is captured in the scotopic system uh, by the uh, photopigment uh, rhodopsin. The scotopic system is located primarily outside of the fovea, so it's your peripheral vision. So if you see something out of the corner of your eye, it will always be white or yellow. It'll never be red or green or blue or whatever. You can't detect color uh, with, your, with your peripheral vision because you don't have any cones looking at them. You have to look directly at it. And this is one of the reasons why people see ghosts. They see very faint light from the corners of their eyes, and then when they look at it, it's gone. So it, they think it's something. It's a weak light, but when they look directly at it, they can't detect it. Mm -hmm. They can only see it through the corners of their eyes. <sighs> okay, so what happens if we are, uh, we're looking for the enemy? Uh, what, are we, what do we want to see from the enemy? We want to see a reflection of light. That's what we're trying to see. So we're starting trying to see something reflecting off of something. Uh, this is one of the reasons why when we first went over to Vietnam, as stupid as we were, we had our name tags were in white mm -hmm. on our green outfits, on our, our you know, I, I, it's, it was dumb. It was really dumb. We had um, uh, yellow, yellow things, you know, if, if, you know, all soldiers have all kinds of ribbons and whatnot. And we wore these stupid ri ribbons. We had all this gold and silver and white. Uh, we had this stuff all over our bodies. Um, and of course, we were, we were invisible at night. We were very visible at night. So we had to change, uh, first we changed the black, and then we realized, wait a minute, black is, can be reflective as well. So then we changed to uh, olive, to, to an, uh, a browner color, to a more camouflage colors, so that we were more camouflaged. At night. I mean, other way, if you watch an, an old war movie from uh, at the beginning of, of the, the uh, Vietnam conflict, like uh, what was that stupid movie that John Wayne made, Green Berets? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look at the the uniforms that those guys were wearing. This was a movie that was made in the. In the middle 60s, like 66, 67, 68. Look at the stupid uniforms that they were wearing. This is real stuff. And, the, and we were not able to function at night because we were, I mean, we were reflecting. All these colors were reflecting. And we complained about the, the Viet Cong because they always wore black pajamas. Well, black is invisible at night. You can't see it. And they would cover their entire bodies. They would wear sandals 
uh, but they would put mud on their feet so that they wouldn't reflect. And so what are we doing? We're wearing polished black boots. <laughs> this is how stupid we are. And it took us years to change so that they couldn't see us in the dark. And today, if you look at uh, military uniforms, if they are combat uniforms, they don't have polished shoes. Polished shoes were, uh, were uh, it was like, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a light and I'm shining it at, at the enemy. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the light reflects off of the polished surface, as stupid as that is. Anyway, I shouldn't complain about the military, should I? <laughs> the dumb things that they do. It takes them forever to change. Uh, the individuals that were successful at living were the ones who broke the rules, who didn't have uniforms that were up to standards. Uh, they didn't wear uh, stripes, or they didn't wear lieutenant's bars, or they were captain's bars, or whatever. Well, you couldn't, because if you wore the bars, it's reflective, and, and now all of a sudden, you're, somebody's going to shoot you in the head. As sad as that is. Or they're, you know, you, you're, you've got uh, shiny boots like they wanted. They could do this in World War II because they didn't fight at night very much. Uh, but in Vietnam, we were constantly trying to, to keep the enemy from encroaching on where we were at night. Uh, the phot phot photopic system consists of all the cones in your eyes, about 4 million per eye. Uh, so 4 million on one side, 4 million on the other. Uh, this system detects color and requires relatively strong stimulation and therefore is primarily a day vision system. It sees colors. Mm -hmm. The photopic system is located primarily in the fovea, but is present in other areas of the retina, but in lower concentration. Uh, there are three forms of photopigments called opsins that detect the three color groupings, as we were saying before, the, uh, yeah, the three different colors, color groupings, the blues and purples, the greens and yellows, and the reds and blacks the darker colors. Come on. <clears throat> the photopigment for the scrotopic system is rhodopsin. Uh, the photopigment for the photopic system is one of the three configurations of opsins. All the photopigments in the eye are made up of two parts, retinol and opsin. Uh, retinol is, uh, is short for vitamin A, uh, or vitamin A aldehyde, or retinaldehyde shortened to retinol. This is what we call it, retinol. <clears throat> there it goes. Light activates the rhodopsin molecule uh, to rapidly lose its retinal, uh, leaving an enzymatic receptor site on the opsin molecule. The enzymatic opsin uh, molecule combines rapidly with G protein transducin. Uh, transducin in turn acts on pho uh, phosphodiesterase or PDE uh, to convert sickly guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP, to 5-GMP. You can see it's, it's just as uh, intricate a system as, uh, as smelling yeah. and the odors. Uh, cyclic uh, GMP inhibits uh, sodium channel closing with the conversion, and the sodium channels close. The loss of sodium ions depolarizes the neurons. Yes, it's a fairly uh, intricate system, but I mean, this is instantaneous. Uh, so we do, we do detect, uh, we're detecting color, or we're detecting eyesight all the time. However, what if you wake up at night? It takes, it takes a couple seconds for your eyesight to start working, if you're looking out in the dark. Yeah. Some, something awakens you right away. It takes a little time for all of this stuff to, to start functioning in your, in your, uh, in your brain. Since we are dealing with millions of receptor cells at the same time, weak light will only hyperpolarize some of the receptors, and bright light will hyperpolarize most of the receptors. Uh, thus, the response will always be graduated as to the amount of light that is detected. Uh, this form of response leads to sensitivity. Uh, it, allow, it allows for adaptation. It allows the individual to integrate the stimulus over time and over what they said that is. And I'm just talking to Earlson, so I guess I'm okay, since you're in my next class anyway. Yes, I... <laughs>